We are continuing with assignment one. I went ahead and posted my progress so far in Canvas. I recommend you do the same, even if it's just an inspiration or a sketch, because by midnight tonight, by 11.59 tonight, is the deadline for the project. And you'll see that in Canvas with the assignment. And it's always nice to know your, your thinking and your progress. So the required element that's part of your process is your sketch. So I posted my sketch and then where I got to at the end of last class was the rough placement of at least five elements to make up the intentions of my sketch. So you can see that here. You can see, and this is just a screen grab from Photoshop, but you can see that there's a lot of little halos around things. The colors and the lighting don't quite match, especially of my focal point tree, that I have extra space around it that I'm going to crop to for the final. So you want to know where your image actually is. Sometimes you have to crop it a little bit smaller than your sketch. Sometimes you want to grow your sketch. I ended up growing more sky than I had in my sketch because I liked the height of the tree that way. So I am going to open up my folder, open up my assignment one, and open up my working file, which is the PSD format, stands for Photoshop document. I mark them as green. And that will have all my layers. At this point, I'm really just going to be focus, focusing on those, those individual layers and cleaning them up and getting them to work as well as they can. But just as a quick review, how do you bring a new element in? So if I think one of my elements is pretty boring, and my sky is, is pretty boring, I've got these kind of twin suns in sunset, that's fine. But it's just not a super interesting sky. So I bet I could pretty quickly find a better sky. And often you'll do this instead working too hard with content aware to build pixels. Sometimes you just want to find more targeted reference to use. And I'm going to go to Pixabay because it has the largest high resolution, non-watermarked, free, free of royalties and, and creative co copyright open or creative commons open images. So I'm going to look at I'll be, and when I search for Celestial Sky, I'm going to see some digital art fantasy composites. I'm going to see some Hubble Space Telescopes, telescope stuff, which might be nice. I have the Aurora Borealis. I have nice shots of the Milky Way. And what I want to use is something that's not going to be recognizable when I use it, right? So I don't want to take an image like this, which is this digital composite of, of Kuala Lumpur with Hubble Space Telescope imagery. I don't want to just take that and just add my stuff on top of it like it's a sticker sheet. I want to just use the, the targeted element that I see. And I love this. But then there's related images that are on Pixabay. Be careful that you're not choosing ones that are on a stock site that you have to pay for. But this is just a nice, cool sky, celestial sky. So I go to free download. Because I'm signed in, I can go for the largest quality. And I want 5,000 by 3,000. You know, don't use anything that's less than 1,000. Then I download it. And if I want to, I can donate to the author, give them some PayPal bucks. But I'm an educator. I give enough. <laughs> but that's how Pixabay works. It harkens back to the early days of the internet when people were freely giving and supporting each other's creative interests. All right. Then I simply take that downloaded image. It's already high enough resolution. It's a JPEG. I just drag and drop it onto my image. It will come in as a smart object, which I can immediately scale. 
and distort if I want to by holding down shift. You know, I can squeeze it a little bit. And then I'm just going to place it behind and then move it on top of my pre-existing background layer. So one way we can change color is by compositing things on top and then playing with aspects like opacity. And I can let it kind of fade in. And then I get the kind of celestial clouds and the stars, and it makes it look more otherworldly. I can also use blending modes. So there's opacity, but then there's also where it says normal. And we've done this with multiply before. If I do multiply, it's going to get pretty dark. Right? Um, but that's multiply at 58%. So I can also try things like lighten, and then I'll get little daytime stars <laughs> in the sky that weren't there otherwise. Or overlay is often a good choice. You can see those different, it kind of splits the difference between the two. We'll be using overlay later when we're adding our creatures into our background. So if I do overlay at 100%, you can see that the twin suns are still there. But now I have stars and kind of celestial clouds in the sky. So if I like that background, I don't even need to rasterize that yet because I'm not cutting anything out from it. Then I can start color correcting to match that. And so I'm going to move up from my background first to this element. And now that I've had you know a weekend since I've worked on it, I can have fresh eyes a little bit and maybe see that I want this mountaintop to maybe move over a little bit, be a little bit more visible in the landscape, instead of being there, being, where did I have it originally? Instead of being there, instead being here. And I think I like that more. But now I have to, figure out its coloring and its lighting and really cut it out well. So to do that, I'm gonna turn off the, the mountains in front of it, just so it's, just really, it's really easy to see. And this works pretty well with this sky. If you squint, you can kind of see how this atmosphere on this horizon works, but I am going to use what are called direct adjustments. So this is the new thing that's super important that we've only touched on a little bit before. This is to correct the lighting and correct the coloring of your elements once you have them placed and before you have them cleanly cut out because this will make cutting them out easier because the colors will match better. So I go to image at the top and I go to adjustments. I call these direct adjustments because this will change the pixels in the layer directly. What we do not want to do is go to layer and then layer adjustments. And these will be the exact same options, but a layer adjustment is more for photography when you want to do what's called non-destructive editing. This is for direct adjusting when you want to really affect the pixels completely. All right, so I go to image adjustments, and the first one I'm going to do is levels. We're always going to do three, and we're always going to do them in this order. Levels, then color balance, then hue saturation. And it's their degrees of power. Levels is very powerful, and it adjusts the, the lighting, the shadows, the midtones, the highlights. Because it's so powerful, I'm not even going to touch the highlight triangle or the shadow triangle. I'm only ever going to play with the midtones. And I'm going to decide does it look better if I shift it brighter, or does it look better if I shift it darker? This is basically brightness contrast with a little bit more control. So I think. I'm going to shift it a little bit darker, a little bit more dramatic. I don't want it to fade so completely into the horizon. So I'm going to shift it to the right a little bit, just that mid-tone scale. And then I can decide if it's too bright, because it is pretty bright, and it's kind of bright on the wrong side. So I'm going to use the limitings 
and the limiting outputs are these bottom triangles and I'm going to limit how bright it can be and that will take my whites down let's take it to like a 15% gray but that didn't do anything for my color so if I go back in my history before I did levels you could see what it was and you could see how powerful levels is at changing it All right, next, I'm going to go to image, the next direct adjustment, and I'm going to play with the color balance. This is the temperature of the lighting. So right now we're in a classroom with yellow fluorescent lights. And so if we took a, a screen grab of yourself, it's not going to match the, the neutral tones of your hair, your skin, your clothes. Everything's going to have yellow added to it, right? So that's the light temperature. That happens in landscapes all the time. Right now, this photo was taken with an overcast day in winter. It's very blue filtered light. So I might want to take the midtones of the color balance. There's a theme. We always start with midtones. And I'm going to shift it a little bit away from blue and a little bit more towards yellow. So if I shift it too much, you'll see all that yellow. So this is more subtle. Then I'm going to shift the cyans a little bit towards red. That's just going to give me a little bit more rounded color. I don't think I need to play with the middle one. And I don't, I could play with the highlights. This will do more in the foreground, like make the highlights more warm and make the shadows more cool. But I don't think that's necessary in the extreme background. So let's see what I did with color balance. It was this which looks very one note, but now with color balance adjusted, it's a little bit more dimensional. And now my last image adjustment. Again, we'll learn this through repetition. This is the, the really crazy changes. Hue saturation. Hue saturation allows me to change the complete color, the hue of the object on a spectrum. So I can turn it into a red mountain, an orange mountain. That's not usually how this should be used because you'll lose the diversity of, of color within the object. But you can shift it a little bit to the left or right depending on the context. So I'm going to move it a little bit to the left. And that's going to warm it all up. And then you can play with whether you saturate it more or not. Right? And if you desaturate, that's the intensity of the color. It's just going to be grayscale which isn't very much fun. But if I really up the intensity, maybe even to like 30, because this was a pretty monochromatic image, that's going to give me a lot more texture and a lot more kind of visual interest than it had before. So before hue saturation, after hue saturation. I can already see so much more in there. And that will make cutting it out a lot easier. So now, how do I cut this out? First of all, it's all about having overlaps. So notice that behind this, I have something that's just completely filled in. So I could erase away as much of this mountain as I want. And I'll still have pigment there. I'll still have pixels. I won't go back to, to blankness. But instead of just using the 100% soft eraser like I have been, I want to try to preserve that sharp edge. Even if it's in the background, I want everything to be as in focus as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my magic wand and see if this works. But I want to make sure my magic wand has contiguous turned off first. And it will show me everywhere that there's pixels that match that, that sky. And there are lots of pixels that match that, including in the mountain itself. So I, that's not going to work for me. That will work well for trees and things where the sky is coming through. But for this, I'm going to want my, I'm going to deselect, I'm going to use my magic wand, and I'm going to turn my contiguous on. So it's only going to select pixels that are touching and similar. I'm going to use the default tolerance of 32, and then I'm going to hold down shift and add to that selection all the way around my mountain until it selects something.